after elections, where there is a peaceful transformation of power from one government to another. And this takes place in a highly democratic manner. The leader of opposition, Azad Saab, rightly said that we keep moving places without any rancor, without any ill will, and then perform the functions which the electorate has really given to us. That's the strength of Indian democracy. So five years ago, exactly on the same occasion where I, I was sitting where my friend Mr. Gulam Nabi Azad is sitting, I had said that the election results always produce a winner, they produce a loser. But the strength of a democracy is that the winner must never get arrogant. He must always have the modesty of a winner and realize that he is the, he's a trustee of popular mandate, which is a challenge for him to perform. The loser can't be bitter. He has to be gracious. Nobody is born to rule forever, and therefore people will change places. And therefore, any person who doesn't succeed in an election must always be gracious when he doesn't succeed. He can't be grudging about the role that the electorate has given him. But, sir, these results have a much deeper meaning. And if we seriously, in the historical perspective, realize, analyze these results, Besides the result which produces a popular government, there are many significant aspects of this result. After three decades, 30 years, that's after 1984, we have a Lok Sabha where the electorate has voted one single party with an absolute majority. We are an alliance government, we'll continue to be an alliance government. But in the last 30 years, in none of the general elections, was a single political party able to get a 272 figure. We had thought that we are in an era of alliances. We are in an era of coalitions. My party believes, despite the 282 figure, that we are in an era of alliances because alliance represents the federal character of India. They represent the strength of India. We don't treat the alliances as a burden, we treat this as a great credit. And therefore, there is one great significance of this result, that after 30 years, you can have a party with an absolute or a tall majority. But within that majority, the changing character of India is visible. I should not be misunderstood in this analysis. There are many cases where people have not governed to the best of their abilities. And they thought that the social support base of the party, which is a political word that we use for caste support base in India, despite inadequate governance will come to their rescue. It has happened in the past. But the second lesson is that if you don't govern well, caste alone will not save you. Therefore, you either perform or you perish. And therefore, parties which have got single digit seats or not a single seat. My friend Mr. Satish Bishra was giving us sermons that the Congress has traveled from here to the other side and we've traveled here and we are in the danger of moving there must seriously introspect the figure that his party did not get in UP. What people want is governance, and not merely combinations or a social combination as a substitute for governance. People who thought that even if there are allegations of corruption, there are conviction orders against them, there are serious allegations, by just manipulating their position in coalition politics, they can continue to survive. Across the board have received a serious setback. Those who thought they can switch alliances 
and therefore defy the mandate which put them in power earlier. What was the lesson by the electorate? Those who thought that political leadership doesn't grow on merit but only grows within families, center or states, who relied on dynasties as the only instrument of leadership creation, by and large have suffered a serious setback in this election. And those who thought and who used phrases like consolidation of a particular caste or community, vote bank politics, strategic voting, most of them again suffered a setback in the election. What do all these facts indicate? That Indian democracy now is evolving. We've seen a maturing of Indian democracy where people gave a verdict which is far higher than what some of us also expected. People don't want political instability. People want governments to govern for five years. They want governments to govern for and govern well. And whether it is dynasties or it is caste or it is merely religious issues that somebody said, these will not be substitutes for governance. People were getting, feeling helpless. They even got angry at some time. And therefore, this verdict is all about an anti-incumbency against a particular party or a government and an expression of hope in another party or government. So where my party or my coalition or alliance has benefited, is on both counts. We gained because of anti-incumbency against our opponents. We also gained because we were the beneficiaries of a hope being expressed in us, and in particular, our leader, Mr. Narendra Modi. It is not surprising, sir, we may try and uh, defy this reality, that after decades, I saw the return of massive crowds in public rallies. Now, those who don't understand this trend as to why this was happening, and these are not managed crowds, these were people who came because uh, there was a larger expression of hope, and this hope was born out of helplessness. And that is why I feel that the burden on our government is going to be much higher because people expect us to perform. My only appeal to my uh, friend and senior colleague, Azad Saab, is, There is one danger if we have continued to be in governments for a very long time. Your party has been in power for a very long time since independence. Last 10 years you were in power in one stretch. And governments, when they give big advertisements and spend hundreds of crores on them, get into a trap of believing all their own advertisements. The world is not believing those advertisements, but those who give those ads start believing in them. When I heard my learned friend today, I saw the same problem that he was buying his own propaganda. So all that had appeared in those Bharat Nirman DAVP ads is really not all what the people see happening on the ground. If 90% of uh, what is required to be done, you have already done, then we should be on velvet. So there is very little we have to do and the people will be satisfied. But if our target, as per your advice, is only 10%, within days, not weeks, we will find a of people outside. The verdict against you is not that you had done 90% and people were only upset about the balance 10%, but people were angry why things were happening. Are you aware of what's gone, what is the stage in which you have left the country behind? In 2004, when you came to power, despite uh, slowdowns, East Asian crisis, we had limped back to a 8.5% growth. 
I used to hear my friends, the ministers in the previous government saying, our average is better than your average. You inherited 8.5%. What have we inherited? For the last two years, India has grown at less than 5%. And less than 5% for India is a disappointing thing. If India didn't have a government, it probably can still grow at less than 5%. The April figure of inflation is 8.9%. So low growth rates, high inflation, fiscal deficit, more than 4.5%. Because of low growth rate, tax collections have suffered. So your budgeted uh, tax GDP ratio was 10.9%. Actually, you ended the year at 10.1%. So you have left the country behind at low growth rates, high inflation, high fiscal deficit, lower tax collections. And what is worse, the enthusiasm in Indian economy was shattered. The investment cycle was broken. Forget people from outside, domestic investors are moving outside. And if you have no investment, there will be no jobs, there will be no revenue. The government won't have money for infrastructure uh, programs, the government won't have money for social sector uh, uh, schemes. So it won't be poverty alleviation. You have left the country behind to use your own language. Not at the level of poverty alleviation, but you have elevated poverty. If that is the situation, there is only one or two good trends, let me concede. The current account situation, deficit situation is better. But the election results itself has become an important political statement for it. And therefore, this country has got a second advantage. That once again, the investing community, both domestic and international, has started looking at India. And therefore, for us, who are really the repositories of public confidence, all elected members in both houses and the state governments, the onus is now on us whether we can convert this once again to an opportunity or not. I think uh, any government, when it takes over, must honestly understand and learn lessons from what went wrong and why did it go wrong. We don't commit the same mistake. My honest assessment is, you, some of my friends, I'm sure, will disagree. In any democracy, particularly parliamentary democracy, one-party government or a coalition government, the office which is most accountable is that of the prime minister. The prime minister must have the last one. I have gone publicly on record uh, praising the Prime Minister of your government, at least uh, in some matters. I called him a man of great scholarship, which I believe he is. I called him a man of great personal integrity, which I do believe he is. And I have no difficulty in reiterating that. But then, unless you give such a man the last word, the right to overrule others, Unless he had that power, governments can't run. You can't create structures outside the government with obsolete ideas and make them more powerful than the Council of Ministers and make them more powerful than the Prime Minister itself. A Prime Minister, it's brought to his notice that there are cases of corruption. Go back to November and December 2007, when letter after letter was being written that all is not well in the spectrum allocation. That's when the Prime Minister must have the last word and he must say, I overrule it. 
when there was nepotism in coal block allocations, the prime minister has to step in and say, I must, I won't allow it. Let's not be under this impression that a prime minister then is some kind of a superhuman being, but he is the leader of the government. The buck stops with him. And therefore, that is where he had to act. If there is instability in taxation policy, something which became a defining moment against us, the prime minister has to step in and say, well, I think the repercussions of this will be far worse. I don't allow this. And let me say this. For any government to be able to take the country forward, it has to force a larger consensus with almost all political parties or at least the main political parties in opposition. If you think that you will deal with the opposition parties only through investigative agencies, then investigative agencies can harass their op your opponent. They can't win an election for you. But in the process, you end up destroying an atmosphere of consensus. So the lessons we've learned from this is governments must function. The principal body which runs the government is the Council of Ministers. The Prime Minister has the last word. If our Prime Minister sees a corruption anywhere, he has to step in and stop it. He has to be tough, at times even ruthless in dealing with such situations. And it's only then that the country can proceed. Mishraji said, how long will it take for the Lokpal to be constituted? Now just look at the history. You spend years, whether you need him, a Lokpal, you don't need a Lokpal. You came out with a weak Lokpal. Then the Parliamentary Select Committee produced a better bill. For months, you did not allow the bill to be passed. After it's passed, you frame rules which are contrary to the Act so that you can still control the Lokpal appointment. I think all these things which were done have now to be undone. And the spirit of that law which this Parliament has enacted has to be given full effect to, I have no doubt it will be given full effect to, very soon. Sir, with regard to what's contained in the Honorable President's speech, my party and the government of which I am a representative here is very clear. The first right of all our resources does belong to the poor. There are areas, even geographical areas, the Northeast, the tribal areas, where we haven't spent the kind of money we should have spent in the past, and therefore priority will have to be given to these areas. But we have major challenges. Our major challenging is challenging how we have to revive the national economy. Our manufacturing sector growth has gone into the negative. And jobs are created in the manufacturing sector in a big way. If two years continuously your manufacturing sector growth is in the negative, it's those driving southwards, then where are the jobs? India missed the first industrial revolution. We got an opportunity the second time when several Asian countries were going in for low-cost manufacturing. We are on the verge of missing that. And I think this is our last opportunity to catch up with that and make India into a low-cost manufacturing hub. We have to concentrate both on physical and social infrastructure in this country. Let's not be under the impression and buy our own propaganda and say we've done 90%. Indian railways. After 1947, the track length has only increased by 10%. So most of the railways we have is the one the British left us. Are we ready to unlock the potential of the Indian railways in a country of our size? Our highway programs, just honestly ask somebody to introspect how many highways, how many kilometers of highways have been built in the last few years? 
since the national highway program had started the lowest uh, years are the last two years towards the end of your term some contracts have now been given for the future rural infrastructure ports airports in skill development you started a program but we have much longer to travel in there some programs may overlap some may have to be tweaked there is no copyright in the matter of poverty elimination or poverty alleviation as you call it so if healthcare programs have to start it's the same people to whom you have to provide healthcare there is no copyright on ideas but at the same time are we in a position whether it's higher education or it's uh, universal primary education are we collectively willing to take all this as a challenge dr maitrian referred to an important part of the president speech which referred to cooperative federalism if we want india to move towards cooperative federalism then states have to be an equal partner in the entire growth process you can honestly ask representatives of states this is the council of states whether some states have been targeted in the past with their programs not being cleared and the proposals in relation to those states not being cleared that hurts the country that doesn't really hurt that state and we do believe our prime minister has said in the course of the campaign repeatedly and we are going to seriously try and uh, find out whether in clearing large projects the participation of the states even in the decision making process when the central government decides has to be encouraged after all no project can be implemented in a state without the active cooperation of a state and when you do that you don't have to look at the political complexion or color of that state well if india has to grow the a lot has been said about uh, various issues relating to minorities and other uh, incidental facts well india has to function in a compassionate manner in a non discriminatory manner there will be issues in the future also but the majority of our society will be if we are able to resolve them with a sense of responsibility that we make uh, the country stronger and don't allow these issues of social tensions to precipitate or perpetuate beyond a point my party particularly sir on issues of national security has always given it topmost priority and therefore needless to say the government will give it a topmost priority also whether it is issues relating to insurgency terrorism or violence and we will try and see that the strongest measures are taken both socially and in terms of security in order to see that these are curbed at an initial stage itself finally sir just one sentence our policy with regard to our neighbors is predominantly guided by our own security considerations our policy with regard to dealing with the rest depends on our personal relationship as also our own economic interests we will be guided in those interests in those matters by these interests itself all that i have to say sir is the president's address in many ways may agree with what some of the things that your government had planned in the past and therefore these are areas on which there is a need to build a national consensus and if we are able to build a national consensus on these areas i think it will be in the interest of the the larger interest of the country i had said sir that uh, we must all have modesty and graciousness the elections are over we meet for elections after 5 years and we can effectively use these 5 years to make this country far stronger and far maturer than what we are today thank you sir thank you